Hey everyone, Cursed Deck Builder here, making our way to 10,000 decks assisted. And here we have Quain Painful Draw. This, or Spiteful Draw. I'm going to say Spiteful Draw because that's a reference to one of my favorite cards in Magic, Spiteful Visions. So Quain Spiteful Draw. This deck comes to us from Paxt, who says, Oh boy, I'd love to hear some niche cards for the deck. Thank you. Quain, and then your cards, your damage, the name of the deck. No budget. This is a really, really cool deck, and I wish I had more niche cards. I think the cards that I'm going to add are for consistency. But before we get to that, we have some upkeep to do. For those who watch the channel, we have completed just over 100 videos, which, if I do my math right, is 1% of the way to 10,000 decks. Crazy, eh? I just have to do this a hundred more times and it'll be done. With that in mind, I might do a little video tomorrow about, you know, us getting 1% there and my plans for the channel. This has really been kind of built around me just having fun and enjoying looking at people's decks. And I don't want it to make a, you know, I don't want to make a job out of it or anything. But I might have to think of little options or ideas I will have to make this a little more palatable for our viewers and, you know, a little more interesting and a little easier on my end. But that is future talks. For now, if you'd like to go and see this deck list, please look in the video description below. It's a really, really cool deck list. I do I find it really, really fascinating and I think it's really, really cool. And I highly recommend you take a look at it. Maybe you'll think of something I haven't and we can improve the deck that way. Also, while you're there, there is a form you can fill out in the video description below. And with that, you can send me your deck and maybe I can help you make your deck better. Finally, if you want your deck to be the next deck I look at, there is also a link for that in the video description. So who is Quain? Why are we using them for our Spiteful Draw deck? Well, Quain is a 1-3 for 2 in Azorius, that's blue-white, Rabbit Wizard. Already, that's pretty cool. You tap them, and they say each player may draw a card. Then each player who drew a card this way gains one life. What an interesting kind of group Huggy Commander, you might say. Well, Pax says no, actually. This is not a friendly little, you know, gain, give everyone extra card draw commander. This is a spiteful card draw deck. How does that work when we're not in black or red? Well, we have some artifact options. Black Vice enchants an opponent, actually it artifacts an opponent, I should say. It's like a curse. You pick an opponent and for every card over four they have, they will take that much damage. Then we have some more, I guess, hit more opponent ones. Ebony Owl Netsuke says at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if they have seven or more cards, the owl does four damage to them. Likewise, Iron Maiden is each opponent's upkeep, one damage for each card above four. And I think there is, so Miser's Cage is Two damage for each for when they have five or more cards, but there's one more, which is, I believe, Viceling, who says the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, it's X damage minus four, where X is the number of cards in their hand. But that's not nearly enough, you might say. Well, I'd be inclined to agree, and we have a few cards here that can help us, you know, get a few more copies. Clever Impersonator, Phyrexian Metamorph, and Stolen Identity, I think there's one more. Where is it? I think Sculpting Steel is another copy. These are all cards that will come in as copies of this card. Oh, there's one more here. Mirror Maid also comes in copy of an artifact or enchantment. So these cards either come in as copies or create copies of these artifacts. And therefore, when we do that, we will have more than the acceptable amount of Vicelings or Black Vice or Iron Maidens. And if that's not good enough, we've got two alternative wing cons. 
Psychosis Crawler just deals damage as we draw cards. And then we have also, really interestingly, Folio of Fancies, which can cause our opponents to mill out should we... Actually, yeah, mill out, right? We get them keep drawing cards, and then for three a turn, they mill the number of cards in hand into their graveyards, which is really, really interesting. Both abilities are really strong here. Folio of Fancies gets better with copies as well, so another pretty good card. And obviously, Smothering Tithe is a MVP here. Very, very strong. Very, very great. Just overall, a fantastic card. You will get plenty, plenty of treasures. Now, I've just been singing the praises of this deck because I do think it's really unique and really good. I think it's a very fun deck list that you can bring and people won't really know what to do with it. But now I'm going to talk about some of the cards that I don't love as much. And to do that, let's scroll down and look at our curve. Well, our curve is really nice mostly. We're kind of low on one mana cards for a deck like this, but we'll see what we can do, right? We have some rule of law effects. I forgot to mention this. We have rule of law and deafening silence, and I'm gonna suggest more, but we have ways to kind of make up for the fact that our opponents are gaining this many cards into hand. So let's see what we've got here. If we go all the way to eight, we can see we have Undo Inversion, which is a land on the other side, so we don't mind. At seven, we have Temporal Cascade and Thought Reflection. And Thought Reflection is interesting because it's gonna draw us tons and tons of cards, but it's a lot of mana and it's a lot of work. I'm pretty sure we have Teferi's Ageless Insight already, so I don't see why we need a seven mana version of this card. And I think, I think, sorry, I'm just putting a card to the side. I think this one is a little too weak. It's a little too much mana. We don't have a lot of ramp. We've got Arcane Signet and Soul Ring mainly. And even if we draw an extra card all the time to guarantee our land drops, it still takes us a very long time to get to seven mana for Thought Reflection. And then seven mana for Temporal Cascade, technically, let's see, just the seven, because we don't want to entwine this. Uh, we might, but I don't think we, yeah, ha shuffles the hand back in. We just want the seven mana cost. So this is seven mana, each player draws seven cards. This is interesting. You have to remember this deck doesn't want to wheel. It just wants to add cards to players' hands. And with that in mind, I find this, this is tricky because this could be really, really good, but this is like our finisher, right? We have to have completely set up the rest of the board. We have to have several Vicelings or the like, or we have to have already Smothering Tithe in play. And with that in mind, Temporal Cascade for seven mana at sorcery speed to draw everyone seven cards. If you aren't very far ahead and set up, this card is just atrocious to play. So with that in mind, I'm gonna say this one could be cut too. You can definitely find better cards for similar effects, but all in all, I just think seven mana is too much for this one-time effect. If we look at six mana, Stolen Identity is great. Well of Ideas, which I've had problems with in the past, actually works really, really well here. And so no problem there. Starting at five mana, things are pretty good. I think Body of Knowledge is a little cute. I, I think it's cool, but it has no evasion. You have no way to give it evasion, so it's just a big beater. It reminds me of the card that comes in as like, it doesn't, it doesn't animate your library. I know that's in one of the joke sets, but it, it, makes, it makes a creature with a plus one, plus one counter for each card in your library. So just a giant creature. And that card I don't like because it has no evasion and no way to hit. So I don't know exactly why I would like this. Granted, this one, you know, when it deals damage, you draw that many cards, is dealt damage. Oh, I'm sorry, it's dealt damage. Okay, that has some perks, but it also has some downsides. I like it dealing damage. I guess that's, hold on, sorry, let me finish my brain thought. I guess if it's dealt damage, that's better because you can force blocks because otherwise it's like an 8-8 eight, eight or greater. But even then, I'm not entirely sure exactly how good this effect is. I'm gonna say keep it on your 
radar because it's interesting, but it's a bit much. I think Promise of Loyalty should just be Supreme Verdict. Uh, as much as I like Promise of Loyalty as a interesting kind of card, it's just a bit fancy, and I don't think this deck has room to be really fancy outside of its main idea. And sometimes four mana can't be countered board clear is exactly what you want, and that's what I would recommend. The rest of these I think are very good. Al Alhamaret's Archive is another card uh, draw doubler, but I like this one a little more because it's five mana. That being said, I don't know, I guess we can use the gain twice as much life off of our commander to gain two life per tap. That doesn't feel really good, but I don't think we really have many other options. So I'm, I'm not too keen on this. Let me just see the last few. M Mist of Stagnation. Interesting. So, permanents don't untap during their controller's untap step, and at the beginning of each player's upkeep, the player untaps a permanent for each card in their graveyard. I don't think this is good here. Maybe I'm really confused. You're not, you're not playing Rest in Peace, I don't think, which is what would make this card really, really good, or some kind of way to make this one-sided. And the thing is, is if you don't have Folio Fancies out and your opponents don't have a maximum hand size, there's a very high chance they're going to discard at the end of their turns after you force them to draw so many cards, which means their graveyards should be stacked with cards, and therefore this card doesn't really do much. That's what my gut is saying. I, I don't know. Maybe there's something I'm missing here, but I think it's particularly weak. Sphere of Safety, uh, should this just be... You do have a lot of enchantments, but I, I find Sphere of Safety is kind of tough. It needs to be, you need to have, I would say, at least four enchantments in play to justify it, because otherwise you could be playing Ghostly Prison or Propaganda, especially since both are options in your colors. And with only 16, sorry, 14, my glasses are off, 14 enchantments, I don't know if that's enough. If you up the enchantment count, I will be less, you know, critical of Sphere of Safety, but unless you can guarantee four you know, four enchantments in play with this card out. It's just you should probably play rule, uh, not rule of law, uh, propaganda or ghostly prison. Okay, looking through four drops, um, selfless squire feels a little strange. It's a it's a creature that flashes in, it fogs, and then it grows. I don't like this as much as like I guess I'm trying to think that. I, I like that ink ink card that uh, that fogs and creates inklings for each damage prevented. So why don't I like this card? I guess I don't like it because it's instead of going wide, it stacks the damage onto this one creature and stacks yeah it stacks the power. And because of that, it's very susceptible to like targeted removal. If this was a blink deck, perhaps I'd like it a little more, but. Uh, I think what you could do instead, if you want the fog effect, either Teferi's Protection or just Holy Day, nothing wrong with just playing Holy Day, one mana just to prevent all combat damage, I think it's fine. It's not it's not really cool, but it's, it's fine. Uh, one more I want to say in this area is Tales of the, Tales of the Ancestors. Feels like, it feels like this is a card you have very little control over. Because it's really good in a di number of different scenarios, but you have, because a lot of your card draw is each player, I don't feel like you have a lot of control to make this happen. Maybe I could be wrong and like you can use some cards in interesting ways, but I feel like there's a lot of situations where, let's say there's four players sitting down and... I have the most cards, you have the second most cards, and the other two have you know, tied at third. Now that seems fine. You can use this and get everyone to drop to me. But what if I only have one more card than you and two more than the others? And you can't really change that number by pouring in more draw effects because we all draw equally. So the difference in our cards is always the same. To make this, where are we? Even worse, this is a sorcery spell. So you can't even use the fact that your opponent's 
go up a card on their draw card. You have to wait the whole cycle for it to get back to you. And yeah, it's only two mana off of Foretell. That's still four mana total for an effect that I, I just don't think it's going to work really well. Um, it just seems clumsy in a deck that otherwise really knows what it's doing. And I guess I should finish the list looking at three. Nadir, Nadir Kraken feels also weird. This is a very, this is an interesting card, but at a certain point, you just won't be able to afford to keep paying for the one. Now, don't get me wrong. If you have, for example, if you have a situation where Smothering Tithe is out and everyone draws and you get a treasure token each time, like because you're all drawing at the same time, you can then spend that treasure token to keep pumping Nadir Kraken and keep making one ones. But it's just the sheer investment in this strategy that kind of like the mana is a lot. I think Chasm Skulker does the same thing almost by every time you draw a card, it grows. And then when it dies, which is not great because you can get exiled, but if it dies, it'll split into a bunch of squid tokens. I think this is just better if you really want that effect because you don't need to pay attention to it. You don't need to keep putting mana into it. There is a chance it gets swords to plowshares. That's unfortunate, but there's not much you can do at that point. I would also say the fact that the creatures have island walk, the squids, I think is really, really cool and will sometimes become relevant. All right, I think... Ooh, I didn't know there was a blue rule of law. That's really cool. Okay, cool. And then looking at two mana, I don't think I'm going to have any complaints. All right. Nice and easy. Okay, so here are my thoughts before I go into the exact uh, additions. I think this deck has a really, really cool idea and does it really well. I think one of the things we have to be somewhat cognizant about when we're playing this deck is that we're kind of setting ourselves up to lose because we're going to feed our opponents a bunch of cards and then we need to be able to be the one to hit the brakes to make sure they don't defeat us, right? A lot of the times a group hug deck will give everyone the means to defeat each other and at the last second come out with an infinite combo or something just ridiculously unstoppable. We don't have that speed, right? We have to get to this point of setting up while drawing everyone cards, which isn't bad. Don't get me wrong. I really like that Quain just keeps going as you keep setting up. But our opponents are going to be knowing what's going on during that time. And they're going to be able to interact with you if, you know, if they feel like you're becoming too much of a threat. You can't just flip the script and immediately defeat everyone outside of like some really interesting folio of fancies and you know smothering tide shenanigans so it's a little tricky you have to both be the gift giver and kind of the you know the judge not the judge sorry the police of the the board you have to and you have to play politics a lot because you really want your opponents to spend their resources on each other instead of just at you so with that in mind, I want to talk one more thing about Quain. I think there's a lot of times that I'm going to say that like a, a deck is really good and it has a really high ceiling of power. Now, this deck is really inspired and really, really cool, but it has a much lower ceiling of power. And there's not really a way around it unless we're going to, you know, unless we're going to replace Quain. And I don't want to suggest that because I think Quain is really cool and I think this deck is really cool. But I wanted you to be aware that there's just going to be a limit to this deck's power. And I think that's fine. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And this looks like so much, so much fun. One of the reasons I say Quain limits the power of this deck is because literally how he is written doesn't work for the strategy you want him to do. He's almost like a Nambo for the deck, right? So first of all, the draw is a May. So players who are starting to feel pressure don't need, like, can just refuse to draw. Now you might say, Cursed, that's good. We don't want them drawing extra cards, and every turn they don't, we're getting further, further ahead. And I'd be inclined to agree with you if we hadn't spent the whole game drawing them cards, right? Like, to a certain extent, we've gotten to the point that like, 
Well, they've drawn five cards off of Quain, so it's good now they've stopped drawing cards, because that'll mean we can get ahead. Well, that's not really the point of the deck, right? We're not trying to starve them of resources. We're trying to make their situation uncomfortable and, and have them have to make big decisions around which card they cast and whether they draw a card or not. But that decision kind of makes itself. Then the other problem is, and this is really, really weird. This is another way Quain just doesn't, like just kind of conflicts with the deck, is it says if a player draws a card, they, may, they gain a life. Now, this feels kind of meaningless, like a life is just nothing, right? But here's the thing. If we look at Vice Link and we do the math, Vice Link does one additional damage per card in hand. Aha, you've given them an additional card. That's an additional damage. But they just gained a life, negating that additional damage. Isn't that weird? Like, don't get me wrong, obviously, this isn't a problem with multiples. When you have multiples of Viceling or any of the Vice effects, this doesn't matter, right? You've already, you've gotten past it, and now that one damage that gives them one life will do two damage to them. So you're net one extra damage. I hope you're seeing kind of what I'm getting at, right? The other one that's tricky is that cards like, you know, Miser's Cage or Ebony Owl Natsuke just don't they just don't scale past their initial trigger. The owl will hit for four regardless if you have seven cards or 15 cards. So giving them an extra card and a life, you know, kind of negates how the owl works. Once again, I'm left looking at you going, isn't that kind of weird? Um, once again, I don't think this is a bad thing. I think the deck has this like really fun, almost crazed nature of it. I think a little while ago, maybe it was even yesterday, it was probably yesterday, we saw a red-black deck that was Group Slug Hug. And I think this deck is exactly the same thing, but it has the more, more of a hug side to it than the slug, but it's still trying to find that balance. And I still think it's really, really cool, and I think it does the job really well. I think we just have to figure out how to set it up in ways to kind of I don't know, go for the win or, or like get ahead in maybe unexpected ways or more consistent ways so we don't accidentally just lose to the plan that we were doing the whole game. All right, so let's look at some cards I want to suggest. So let's start with the boring ones, and there are a few boring ones. Fabricate will tutor a artifact into our hand. It's just a tutor spell. In fact, if you would prefer, I don't know what that costs these days, Enlightened Tutor is just as good because it puts it on the top of your deck for one mana. Either, and, either these cards and both these cards are a welcome addition to the deck because you have a lot of artifacts that you really, really want. And with Enlightened Tutor, you could actually choose from your artifacts and enchantments, which is really, really nice. Then. Even more boring, so I'll get them out of the way. Azorius Signet, Talisman of Progress, and I should have said Belwar Stone. Uh, I just want you to play more Mana Rocks. One of the big benefits of having such consistent card draw is that you're going to get your mana drops almost every turn. Your land drops, I should say. But even then, I do want you to speed up a little in mana and... In certain, on certain turns, you're going to need to be able to just play a mana rock anyways. Now, this kind of interferes with some of our rule, rule of law strategies. And for that reason, maybe not Felwar Stone, but I think you should play the first two anyways. Until you set it up, these cards are probably going to do you a lot of favors to getting you ahead on mana in the first little part. And remember that a turn two mana rock is a turn three smothering tide which is like the perfect number. You do kind of, you are unable to cast your commander this way, but I think that's fine because getting Smothering Tide early and hopefully it not getting disrupted can basically win you the game. All right, what else do I want to suggest? I've got three more copy enchantment or artifact abilities. So Artificer, Artificer class is your first artifact spell you cast each turn costs one less to cast. 
I think this is cute. I don't mind this too much. Level two, for two mana, it says, you can reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal an artifact. Put it into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library. Now this I find really, really interesting. Because this means for four mana, this card will pseudo-tutor the top artifact of your deck into your hand. Now a lot of your artifacts are really, really relevant. I did just tell you to add more mana rocks that would dilute this, so maybe take that with a grain of salt. But the ability of this card to grab one of your vice cards is pretty high, and I do really like that. And its first, first ability is okay. I kind of like this more than in an artifact deck, because in an artifact deck you have so many artifacts that they're just kind of trash. You, you'll get anything, but here you have a much higher chance of getting what you want. And then for six mana, which is its final ability, you, you are able to get a copy of an artifact every one of your end steps. So I'm really, I'm really putting this out there because the third ability caught my eye, but I think the second ability is good enough to just let it go and not like completely put it in all on the third class or third level of the class. But it's an interesting card. I think you might have to retool your artifacts a bit like to, to make sure you're only drawing the ones you want to make this happen. But the fact that it'll tutor you an artifact and it'll that artifact will cost one less is really, really cool. Something likewise that's just a little interesting is e Echo Storm. Echo Storm will make a copy of a, specifically an artifact. I don't know why it's so specific, but it'll make a copy of an artifact with an additional copy for each time you've cast your commander. Considering your commander is a two mana spell, this card is at least going to get two copies, if not more. Now, this is the kind of card that I think I'd be a little happier if you played, is it Arcanomancer? Uh, I don't know how to spell Arcanomancer. Let's do return. My goodness, return instant sorcery, and I believe she's a wizard. Four mana. We have two of these. Archaeomancer. Okay. So if you played this, I think it would get even better, or any, I'm sure there's other ones. There's probably a three mana that's not attached to a creature spell you can use to return stuff like Echo Storm back into your hand to make more copies. But I think Echo Storm, even that first time where you get two copies of a card for five mana, is pretty good. Finally, the last one I want to suggest, more for its kind of high floor, is Sahili's Artistry. So Sahili's Artistry is six mana, sorcery, make a copy of an artifact, and make an artifact copy of a creature. So what's interesting about this is you can still just play it for the first half, and there's going to be situations where you have Viceling or another creature that you want to make a copy of, and that'll be neat. But I think worst case scenario, this is six mana to create two copies of cards on your opponent's battlefield that you want copies of. And six mana to create two copies is pretty good. Now, obviously there's going to be like a ceiling on your own deck of what's the best two copies, like having Viceling and I would say probably Iron Maiden for damage? I could be wrong here, but I think I think that would be the ones to go for, unless Folio Fancies is better. Or actually, now that I say it, you could just make two copies of Viceling, right? Or is it non-creature artifact for the first one? No, it's just two copies. That's cool. You could just pick you could just pick Viceling twice. Have three copies of Viceling. Your opponents come uh, go to their turn. They have seven cards in hand and take nine damage. I think that would probably be the best way to do this. Okay, let's go a bit further. Something I was thinking about your seven mana spells is Forced Fruition. Forced Fruition is really, really weird. It is a card that every time you look at you go, huh, is this a good card? And the answer is almost universally, well, not really, but, and this is one of those decks that exists within that but, right? Where forcing your opponents to keep drawing more and more cards when they don't have control over like can be really good and put them into really really awkward situations especially obviously with 
our folio fancies that that like keeps them from being able to discard the cards away. So that already I think is very, very good. But then we're going to mix that with maybe one or two more Archon of Emeria style effects. Uh, and by that, I mean rule of law effects. Archon of Emeria is just another rule of law effect. Let's find another one with Edelin. Eidolon? Edelon? I actually don't know how to pronounce this, but I'm going to say Eidolon of the Rhetoric, which also stops players from casting an extra more than one spell a turn. When you have these in play, your opponents are going to have more cards in hand than they know what to do with. And Rule of Law, like you're already playing Deafening Silence, I think you could honestly play as many of these as you want. These are just good cards in Commander. And yeah, they attract hate, but you're not going to mind it too much because you're going to be able to just either protect them with your counter's magic or just summon more and just move on. Well, what's another card like that that I want to suggest? Teferi, Time Raveler. This is a really strong card in Modern, and I think it's still equally strong in multiplayer formats. Now, Planeswalkers are hard to defend in multiplayer uh, formats, but this is really nice because it gives you it gives your opponents a lock not necessarily lock, but it kind of shuts them down to be unable to play around rule of law effects as much as they would. Because one of the ways you get around rule of law effects is by having instant spells that you cast on your opponent's turns and therefore get around that once per turn cycle rule. However, not only does uh, Teferi stop that, he actually enables it for you because now your sorceries, when you plus one him, have flash and you can start getting around the rule of law effects in that way. I think that's really, really cool. And once again, just generally, he's just a really good card, so you'd be pretty happy playing him. Another Teferi that works almost the exact way is a Flash Teferi that says, the, the Creature Teferi, I should say, where creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield have Flash. And each opponent can only cast spells uh, anytime they can cast a sorcery. It's kind of the best parts of Time Ra a Time Unraveler, Time Unraveler? It's Time Raveler, right? My goodness. Yeah, Time Raveler. But uh, Teferi Mage of Zephyr is just the best parts of that other card. Now, it's 5 mana, which is a little tough, but it does have Flash, so you can cast it on your opponent's turn. But it does, with a Rule of Law effect, really, really shut down your opponent's abilities to interact with the game. Also, something really, really important is that once you have a counterspell with these abilities, you can basically rule the entire turn cycle, right? Teferi's out, you have counter spell, you have rule of law. Every time your opponents play a spell, you have the knowledge of this is the only spell they can cast for the turn cycle. And with that knowledge, it gets a lot easier to know when you're going to counter spell these spells, right? You can just flat out say, hey, you know, if you don't interfere with my plant, I'm not going to counter sell you. You don't actually need to tell them that, but that can be your mindset where you just let them do whatever you want. And then you counter spell when they try to interact with you with the knowledge that they can't do anything else. If your opponents band together, they need three subsequent turns of trying to stop you where you have nothing in order to get through this. Very, very strong. I think this works really, really well in your deck. And the last card that I would be amiss to mention in this kind of whole, uh, this kind of trio of cards or card type is Knowledge Pool. What does Knowledge Pool do? Well, when it enters the battlefield, everyone exiles three cards of their library. Doesn't matter. That's not why you're doing this. What this says is whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, that player exiles it. If that player does, they may cast a spell, a spell among other cards exiled with this by, without paying its mana cost. Do you notice what this does with Teferi's out? Yes, it prevents your opponents from casting another spell for the rest of the game. With these two cards out, your opponents will not be able to cast cards from exile because it is, at inst it is not at sorcery speed, but you will be able to, and you will be able to do with impunity. This card also works with rule of law, I should say, actually, because you try to cast that spell, it asks you to cast another spell. So there is an argument that if you have Teferi, rule of law and knowledge pull out, 
You just need to bide your time in order to bounce, use uh, Teferi's minus ability to bounce rule of law. And with that in mind, when they uh, when you bounce that, you can start casting spells again, but they can't. This is a bit tricky. I think the big perk, even if you have this and rule of law, is that you still have access to... How do we put this? You still have access to cards like Folio Fancies, which hopefully you will have in play. And with that, you can still use activated abilities to knock your opponents out of the game. So you got to be careful with this card, but I think this is... Like, I, this is the last card I'm suggesting because I feel like it just ties the whole room together. Because, if you remember, one of the things I said about group hug decks is they often try to win the game almost immediately, and Knowledge Pool represents that. You play Knowledge Pool with a Rule of Law effect, or you play Knowledge Pool with a Teferi out, especially with a Teferi out, because your opponents cannot interact with Knowledge Pool on the stack. And that's not true. They almost can't <laughs> interact with Knowledge Pool on the stack. And would you look at that, you are able to win the game instantaneously. I think these cards would really make the deck uh, a little stronger and a little more consistent. And I think that with that kind of direction, where you're playing cards that are just naturally good, just like just straightforwardly good in Commander, supplemented with Quain's ability to dig you for them, supplemented with the Iron Maiden style win condition of the deck, I think you're going to be in a really, really good situation. I think from there on, you can win the game really easily, and I think the deck will do a lot better. I hope this deck assist was helpful to you. This deck is really, really cool. I really like what you've done with it. I know um, I, I've nitpicked a bunch of it, but like, I, I don't want you to get the impression I don't like it. I do absolutely love it. It's really, really cool. And I would love to see another draft of the deck. There is a link in the video description if you'd like to send me a draft of this deck or any deck that I can make a video of. And if you would like it for your deck to be the next deck I make a video of, there is a link to jump in front of the line there. As always, if you'd like to like, comment, and subscribe, I would be very, very grateful. Anything that helps the channel is really, really nice. And overall, man, I've been talking about this deck for a while. I think I'm just going to leave it at, this is a cool deck, this is a cool strategy, and I'm really interested to see more. All right, take care. And good luck, I should say. <laughs>